Just one after another, responding to the Yanghui's question, please. Thank you Back to my comments. Pertains to the role of the U.S. in the South China Sea Conference, in quotes. What's involved here is political will. And I, I see, Professor, that, that President Wu has successfully enticed uh, a former legal advisor of the State Department, a Abraham Sofer, here. And uh, even before you were legal advisor, I was a, a baby lawyer in that <laughs> office. And uh, in 1972, one of the issues we dealt with was the incidents at sea convention. And that a bilateral between us and the Soviet Union that dealt with the bumping incidents in the Black Sea. And uh, I think that maybe the legal folks for the embassy here who are very capable, <laughs> I'm looking at my, my friend Jin Sun, um, and, and your uh, capabilities with the new think tank here should look carefully at that because believe me, the tensions that you have now are between the United States and China are pretty minor compared to what we were facing with the Soviet Union at that time. And we managed to work out a binding agreement, and it worked. So I think it's an important and interesting precedent. So I think there are, uh, the, the answer to the question is, I think there are opportunities for cooperation between the U.S. and China. Uh, it's a matter of the political will and, and, shall I say, the wisdom on both sides. And there is important historical precedent that I think. Uh, with respect to SUA, uh, I, I, I would pass the buck here to my esteemed colleague, uh, James Kraska. Uh, only will mention that uh, both Taiwan and China are uh, the, the world's largest fishery uh, comp countries. I guess I. I don't want to be politically incorrect here, but the, uh, there are a lot of Taiwanese and, and a lot of Chinese vessels that are catching a lot of fish that are categorized as uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated. And I have a feeling that there is a lot of pressure from the political uh, side in those countries not to allow uh, a lot of um, stop and search uh, activities by enforcement vessels. The last thing before I pass it to, to James is that there, there is no question at law whatsoever that the EEZ is not a security zone. It is not a security zone. That's a territorial sea. It is a, a zone where you have two legitimate uh, players, for example, foreign flag vessels, and let's say enforcement vessels for the coastal state dealing with fisheries enforcement. They're both entitled to do things, but they have to be conscious, and the convention provides for it, that they give due regard to the other users and the enforcement of the other users' rights. So Part of the confusion, and I know where it comes from because I sat there for years and listened to the difference between the uh, Chinese delegation that perceived itself predominantly as a land power, worried about the fact that these major maritime powers at that time, the US, Soviet Union, Russia, now, and uh, Britain and China, uh, Britain and Japan were uh, trying to promote freedom of navigation in the zone. Uh, and uh, so I, I know where the, the tension comes from. It is longstanding. It isn't going to be resolved, probably. But if there's a political will, uh, you can work out modus uh, operandi, as we did with Russia in the Black Sea. And uh, we don't have to uh, train our guns at everybody, uh, each other, when uh, dis disagreements arise. And so that, that is my hope, that, that uh, the, the people with the wisdom and, 
and uh, the background uh, will find ways to avoid it being a shooting match. Okay. Thank you. This is, um, yeah, thanks, just, James. Yeah. Thank you. On, just on the question of the SUA convention, this is the convention for the suppression of unlawful acts against the safety of uh, navigation. And what uh, Professor Nordquist is referring to is, uh, and the question relates to the 2005 protocol, which subsumed the 1988 convention. If you remember, the 1988 convention came about after the Achille Loro hijacking and it has the requirement for states to either extradite or prosecute terrorists because if you recall in that incident the uh, Palestinian terrorists got away they went to Egypt and then they they were intercepted in flight it created some some hard feelings among uh, some of the states involved the 1988 uh, convention is a protocol now convention is a much more robust uh, instrument that is geared toward prevention of terrorism at sea. It's, uh, in my view, far more important than the 1988 instrument ever was. And it is unfortunate. It has entered into force among a small number of states. The United States is going to join the convention, uh, the protocol, now the convention, the 2005 convention. And it has not done so simply as a matter of inertia. Uh, simply because it just hasn't gotten on the docket, gone through the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, received advice and consent, and then gone to the President. Uh, all parties uh, within the U.S. interagency community strongly support the SUA 2005 convention, and in fact, the U.S. was a major advocate of the convention after the attacks of 9-11, so it is a little embarrassing that the United States is not yet uh, a party to that. Um, with regard to the question of uh, the uh, aviation agreement, uh, only time will tell whether you know we get an agreement uh, this year. That's sort of the U.S. hope or the U.S. expectation. I would say about all of these, uh, these the, the two bilateral agreements as well as Q's, they're legally non-binding and they're really based upon other instruments. So if you look at the the uh, the rules of behavior, for example, it's heavily footnoted and it references essentially all other agreements that are already in force and that are for the most part customary international law, like the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, the collision regulations. Uh, and so it sort of begs the question of why you even need an aviation agreement. And as an international law attorney, I would suggest that there, there's not a legal rationale for it, just like there was not a legal rationale for the rules of behavior. The notification of exercises is a political, uh, a, a, a political instrument, but the rules of behavior or any aviation agreement uh, will not change any sort of international law. All they will do is animate or reflect existing law, so then that sort of ask, make, makes the question of, well, why do you need it? And I would suggest that, uh, that you don't need it legally, um, but you may need it politically, and I think it's driven by China that, uh, that wants the agreements as sort of a, um, a trophy or, a, or, a, or a, to signify sort of a sense of, uh, of equality at the table with the United States. So my view is that's harmless enough and uh, why not have an agreement? But there's no law being made. Uh, we're getting to our yeah, so uh, very quickly, a recommendation, a comment, and a question. Uh, the recommendation is, is Thank you. Uh, the recommendation is uh, why, why should we not have our Coast Guards uh, sitting at the table during many of these meetings that our two navies also have and our two governments, whether it's at the SNED, the MMCA, or the confidence building negotiations uh, meetings that we're doing at sea. I, th I think it would be a good thing to get both our Coast Guards there also. So that's a recommendation. Uh, a comment uh, from my good friend uh, Hung Nung. Uh, wh when you showed the slide of, of cooperative strategy for the 21st century from the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard, and Xi Jinping's comments about China's maritime strategy, I was wondering if this was maybe apples and oranges, because Xi Jinping is talking about a national maritime strategy, and CS21 is about the sea services. So we don't have a Chinese Navy maritime strategy to compare it to. 
And the question, which I, I don't think you should answer now, maybe we can talk about it offline, uh, it's only because my understanding of Chinese language is so poor, is that uh, I often get confused or don't think I understand what Chinese friends mean when they use the term Haiyang Changguo to be a maritime Changguo. Is this a maritime power which has different implications than being a strong maritime country? So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thanks, Foam. So uh, before uh, turning back to the lower panelists, let me collect a number of the questions. Uh, Xin Jun. As always, I enjoy, appreciate your insights and enjoy hearing your comments on the law of the sea issues. Uh, it seems that um, we do have difference on um, the term of freedom of navigation. Uh, I, just, I think it's quite clear we don't have any difference on the, uh, the merchant vessels. Uh, that kind of freedom is completely no problem. What we differ in between us uh, is the military access, naval exercise. Um, I, <coughs> I agree with some of your reasonings, but I have difficulty in understanding your conclusion. It seems that uh, you're correct. I think that uh, EZ is nothing about security. Uh, it is even true in the content, if I'm, I'm correct, is even in the content zone, there's no uh, security interest incorporated in the regime. Uh, <coughs> But it seems difficult for me to understand why the coast state is then completely uh, precluded from claiming uh, security interest in that, re in, in that area. Uh, let me get quite, quite clear. It's, there's no regime uh, in UNCLOS entailing the, uh, the security interest. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the coast state don't have uh, the self-help and self-defense rights under customary international law uh, to, to protect that security interest in coincidentally happened in that uh, marine area. Uh, I guess that the state practice quite uh, widely support um, the later one. I'll give you an example of the air defense um, zoom, the, the was 80s. Uh, I, I, my view is uh, just a practice supporting such a view that uh, even happened to be uh, easy, but you, anyway, because the states uh, still justify to interfere the so-called freedom of navigation uh, from the other countries. Uh, <coughs> therefore, it seems to me uh, the Jake, real issue- Just a short term yeah, comments, so uh, we have uh, you know, many hands. Yeah. Uh, whether or not all uh, activities can be justified by uh, the notion of freedom of navigation. I think that is the real point of difference between us. Uh, my view is that if we go back to um, the Cove Channel case, you know, uh, the users, the, the naval power do have the, the right of uh, innocent passage, especially in the territorial sea used for international uh, transportation, uh, international street. ICG is clear, quite clear on that point. But in the meantime, the court also examined the posture of the British war vessels when they exercise the so-called uh, innocent passage uh, during the incident. So it's clear, I, I guess, that it seems not not all activities can be justified in the notion of freedom of navigation. It quite depends on circumstance. If I have some other chances, I will explore, I will expand my, my theory. Thank you. Okay, thanks for so, Alan. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, and thank you to the panel. It's really been very uh, illuminating. I have just a, a quick list of uh, reactions, and there are questions inherent in them. Uh, one on this last comment, which I couldn't hear all of, uh, but I'd like to hear uh, the two American experts up there talk about it, because I think that there's a fundamental difference here. Ambassador Tsui uh, had one uh, very assertive position on what is excluded or what needs to be done, and I thought that uh, 
uh, Professor Kraska in particular uh, was very firm in, in saying uh, that is not how the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated. I think that Hong Nong <clears throat> was very helpful in talking about the differences in looking at freedom of navigation, but they are fundamental. Uh, and it seems to me that's where a lot of this lies. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Professor Nordquist is, was encouraged by what Ambassador Tsui said about the code of conduct. Uh, I confess I was not. Uh, I didn't hear anything new. Uh, this has been under negotiation, quote, quote, for a very long time. And I don't, I, I'd be glad to hear more reason to assume that this is serious at this point, but I, I didn't hear anything. Uh, I would like to have heard, and maybe, uh, I don't know whether uh, Zhu Feng or other Chinese colleagues can elucidate on, on what Ambassador Tsui and Chinese spokespeople have said about the military functions of these uh, reclaimed uh, territories that are being built up on these rocks and shoals and so on. Uh, does it mean they're only self-defensive, that if somebody attacks those particular places, that then they will be, they'll defend themselves? Or does it have a broader implication about uh, use of those places uh, as facilities to dispatch planes and ships and others to defend China's broader claims in the region? It has a much different implication if that's what uh, it's all about. Um, I appreciate the importance of sovereignty. Uh, to China, it's important to everybody. And uh, so China asserts with great certainty that its sovereignty is what it is, it isn't gonna be compromised, don't think otherwise. That's what Ambassador Tsui basically told us, I think quite accurately as a reflection of the government's position. But other governments have the same position. So does this mean might makes right, that because China's bigger and stronger, it gets to uh, tell others that in fact my sovereignty is uh, more valid than your sovereignty, that concerns me. Uh, and I think China needs to address these uh, issues. And finally, on the nine dash line, um, I'd like to hear more about, I, I would like to have heard from, from Ambassador Tsui, what the nine dash line means. Is it a claim to uh, territory within the nine dash line? Is it a claim to waters within the nine dash line? Is it a claim to waters that are uh, associated with land within the nine dash line? because some of those things can't be defended, particularly uh, the waters affiliated with land, if all, if that line is to be taken literally. It, you, can't, you can't get there. Um, so I would, I would appreciate any uh, further explanation, particularly perhaps from Hong Nong, about uh, uh, what the legal basis of that line is, what its implication is. Thank you very much. Okay, Alan, thank you. So uh, last question of this group will be from uh, Gordon, please. Too many questions, but I have a very short one. Uh, we have a great power in the United States which has a focus on freedom of navigation um, globally, and we have a, a coastal state, China, with great sensitivity about territorial issues and in its near region, the South China Sea. But is it not possible moving into the 21st century, China already is the world's leading ocean trader, and with a growing military presence, and a growing naval capacity, that we'll see an evolution of Chinese thinking so that forward a couple decades, the focus of China will rather be on freedom of navigation and its global responsibilities as opposed to simply its own coastal and near region. Thank you. Thank you, so uh, please, uh, maybe we can reverse the order, so Hong Nong, you well first, then Jim a second. Professor, uh, yeah, you are the last one. So. Uh, well, thank you for the question. For Alan's two questions, the first one, sovereignty is important for all the claimant states in the South China Sea, and uh, which I agree upon on that. And we are not here to complete, compete with each other, who is, which country has uh, more evidence and more historical or legal evidence. This is not really appropriate occasion to define that. I think given the difficulty of solving a solving the issue from a legal perspective, and that is why China proposed that we actually can go forward for joint development and putting aside the solving the issue uh, for the time being. I think this is also the wisdom of the Chinese Premier Leader Deng Xiaoping, and we all want to follow the, same, the, the good uh, practice 
but I also have to admit that uh, although we have very good political will to develop joint development, but we do encounter difficulties of defining uh, where the dispute maritime area where we can conduct joint development. And about the question of U-shape line, and I understand the U-shape line, some, um, some of them might actually comply with the most Chinese scholars may uh, share, but some of them may not. But let's just provide my own perspective. On the U-shaped line, firstly, I think within this line, uh, all those features, no matter it's rock or island, and Chinese claim sovereignty within this line. And then based on that, and based on the provision of law of the convention on defining territory C and EZ, and China claims uh, e, uh, territory C when it's a rock, and China are entitled to claim 200 like about easy on continental shore if those features are qualified as an island regime according to Article 121, 121 of Own Clause. And then in addition to that, I think within this line, China is uh, looking forward to a non-exclusive historical right like fishing rights which is, I will emphasize the fact, non-exclusive, and other states also share historical rights in these regions. So China, when they're talking about the historical right, and I think it's mentioned, it refers to non-exclusive uh, manners. And then it's a question why China always used that China claims sovereignty over the Spratly, the Nansha Islands, and adjacent water. Why China did not actually specify what this adjacent water could mean. I think that's due to the complexity of the different legal status of the different features in Spatley. Some of them are only rock, and then they will say the territory sea, and some of them have potential to be identified or be qualified as the uh, island, then we have EZ. So given this fact, and then China used a general term uh, as adjacent water to define that. And my last point to respond to uh, Lao Feng's comment on the Coast Guard's role. I think uh, China and the United States might have a different practice. Like I understand that for the United States, the role of navies and Coast Guard, sometimes they're coordinating with each other in terms of law enforcement and also in terms of other like non-security, uh, non-traditional security um, uh, field. But for China, it's very hard to tell. We have this new Coast Guard established in, uh, in 2013, the Chinese new Coast Guard. But given the fact that China has a lot of maritime dispute with its neighboring countries, although we want to follow or to learn from other mature maritime countries like the United States in terms of the practice of coordination between the Navy and the Coast Guard. But in China's case, it's difficult because if you're using the Navy for law enforcement, and then you will be perceived as aggressive from other neighboring countries. That's why China has been very careful and cautious to only use uh, Coast Guard in terms of law enforcement, especially in the disparate areas. But I think there's room for China to learn from other uh, maritime uh, countries. And there was one theory uh, by one of the UK sea power theories and, and Jeffrey too. And he has a different model of how Coast Guards and the Navy actually can work together or either coordinating or have a separate clear cut of their different function. But I really like to comment, emphasize the role of Coast Guard. Um, with the question, with, with regard to the question about the exclusive economic zone, so uh, let me be clear, as a matter of law, there's no uh, dispute. The, the exclusive economic zone was cut out of the high seas, and under Articles 58, Paragraph 2, and Article 87 of the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, freedom of navigation and, quote, other internationally lawful uses of the sea associated with the operation of ships and aircraft are uh, recognized as permitted within the zone. It's also based upon customary law. There's, there's not a, a, there cannot be a, uh, a question of, quote, different interpretations, because it's an empirical question. It's not a normative question. Because during the conference that, uh, that Professor Nordquist participated in from 1973 to 1982, and you can go back and look at the records, uh, which are online and conveniently searchable, and which I have done, 
The, uh, the records of the nine years of the conference indicate that during numerous times, there were coastal states, not just China, but, uh, but a number of other states, that tried really incessantly to bring up the issue of military activities uh, beyond the territorial sea, the regulation of military activities. And in each of those instances, those proposals were defeated. So in law, if you don't know what, uh, what, what the meaning of a regulation is, you look to the, uh, to the preparatory materials or the trois preparatoire. In this case, you can see that none of those proposals gain the support of the conference. And the, the, the text that we have is the law. It's an empirical question. So you can say that there's a difference of interpretation, and, uh, uh, but that makes law meaningless. I can say that if I commit a crime, that, uh, that I didn't commit the crime, or th if bank robbery is a crime and I go into a bank and I take money and then I say, well, that's not, that's not bank robbery, that's merely, merely borrowing the money, that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't mean that it's not a legal argument. It's just, uh, frankly, it's just, it, um, so you have the negotiating history. Uh, with regard to self-defense, all coastal states, every state has the right of self-defense, and self-defense is worldwide. It, it, there's, no, uh, there's just nothing particular about the exclusive economic zone. So China has no more right of self-defense 13 nautical miles off its coast from a legal standpoint, nor does the United States have a legal, more of a legal right 13 miles off its coast than any other country. Every other country has that same right. The right of self-defense applies globally. That's as a matter of law, so let's be clear, as a matter of law. If you're talking about a political interest, then certainly there are disparities because coastal states have, uh, countries are more interested in things that are close to them. But that's not a legal issue. Uh, that's a policy issue. Uh, with regard to Ambassador Holden's question about whether uh, China might someday sort of evolve and change their view, um, I'm, I've heard this before. I'm not as optimistic. Um, China already operates uh, in the U.S. exclusive economic zone. It collects intelligence in the U.S. EZ. It does so in Guam and, and Hawaii. That doesn't seem to have changed uh, China's position. Uh, and so your question, Ambassador, is uh, presupposes that, that China would act consistently, that it would do the same thing that it expects of other countries. And I'm, I'm just less certain uh, of that. Um, Finally, let me just say one, one other thing very quickly. This idea of different interpretations of the EEZ um, and you know, a variety of other issues, um, unlawful straight baselines that China claims, for example, around the Paracel Islands, uh, setting aside the issue of, of which country actually has lawful title to them, uh, straight baselines along the coast connecting uh, the mainland with Hainan Island, these are the sorts of violations, frankly, of the Law of the Sea Convention that have made it impossible for the United States to join. There, there is less, in my view, there is less support now for the Law of the Sea Convention than ever before in the United States. Yeah, the, the convention was uh, adopted with the implementing agreement in 1994, and for 10 years it was blocked in the U.S. by Senator Jesse Helms. In 2004, uh, and I was in the Pentagon during this time and, and assisted. We, we sent the con convention to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which has to, uh, has to vote the convention out to the floor, voted 21 to 0 in favor of the Law of the Sea Convention. What's the problem? It never got to a floor vote, but it was strongly bipartisan support. There was no disagreement. In 2007, we tried again. The vote was 19 to 4. Uh, so support started to erode. Four Republican senators on the committee voted against it. And then, of course, a few years ago, 34 Republican senators signed a letter saying that they would not support the Law of the Sea Convention. So, and this was before the recent election in which the Republicans gained 10 seats in the Senate. Before they gained 10 seats in the Senate, they had 34 votes against it. Uh, so. I, I don't think the U.S. will join the Law of the Sea Convention for the foreseeable future because it's impossible when you, and I have tried to sell it to staffs on the Hill, it's impossible to, to sell it to them when they say, yeah, but why should we join other countries that are parties don't even comply with it. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, please. 
Well, most of the questions have been touched upon. I'll, I'll just briefly um, add what I can. I think James gave a, a totally accurate uh, de uh, description of the results of the Law of the Sea negotiation. We didn't solve all the world's problems at that convention, and it was a convention, is a convention, that deals with peace. And uh, when Hirsch Lauterpacht at Cambridge prepared two volumes, one on peace and one on war, the one on war was much, much thicker. So uh, when security issues get brought in, uh, I think it's somewhat a, a losing proposition to argue that freedom of navigation in the Law of the Sea Convention itself uh, it dealt with uh, all the security concerns of coastal states. Uh, it doesn't, but that doesn't mean that you don't have customary law, and we could spend a lot of time talking about that. With respect to the code of conduct, I, I think there was something new that was said that maybe you, more of an insider than I, had heard before, but it, the code of conduct has not been compulsory. It hasn't been legally binding. It's been voluntary. And I think what I heard today was that there is discussion about making it legally binding. There's a new group of leaders in Indonesia that are very sophisticated, and they know very well the leadership role that that very important country played. And I, I think that is the only viable solution for uh, diminishing tensions in that area. And I, I, I was heartened, yes, by what was said today. Um, with respect to the nine-dash line, uh, that's, uh, there are lots of ambiguities. Defining merit, what maritime security is is an example. Uh, but there are lots of ambiguities. Uh, my characterization of the nine-dash line is that it is a factor that is part of the historic title claim of the Chinese government. I don't think it's definitive of anything. You make fun of it if you want to. Uh, but uh, I think it, there was an indication there, interestingly, put in by Taiwan. Um, as to the, uh, Ambassador Holden's uh, comment, I am more optimistic, perhaps, than, than, than James is, because uh, I, I think that uh, there is a growing navy in China, and I think that they are going to have some of the same concerns that we have, even as we cripple our own. So. Uh, I, I, I am also aware that it's a fact the U.S. has the largest 200-mile zone in the world. It was imposed on us at the conference. We were fighting it all the way. But we have a huge offshore area in this country, much of which is not properly utilized. But again, that's another story. Okay. Um Time is almost running up, so I'm afraid there's many, any more for us to have a second round, third round. So before the conclusion of the first session, a couple of points to be a chairperson I'd like to uh, share with you. First of all, uh, yes, I think the NCROSS made very clear the easy area is, is being used for military surveillance. In person, I have no disagreement to this. But what concerns the Chinese so much is not how ramification of this uncross article is definitely the frequency and the scope of Americans' military surveillance in China's easy. That's really, really concerned the Chinese POA, concerns the Chinese security expert just like me. So we don't care. So you can just have how much free, freedom of navigation, but the problem is when the military, in terms of the, the, the frequency and scope of a military surveillance, and the mounting and the jumping over to such a high level, that's a problem. Yes, so China, by random, just uh, uh, moving around like Guam Island, uh, even maybe one time close to the Hawaii, but it's extremely and tremendously asymmetric to the US. 
So if the U.S. lay out the, some sort of legal ground and uh, calling on the Chinese POA say, yes, you can come in, let's play the same game, I have to say it's very misleading because it will easily irritate the both sides. Then we will just uh, 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 let the new Cold War hitting back. U.S. is very mature power. Law is not just used to excuse the U.S. of any, any irritating and even problematic deeds. So for that point, I really hope surveillance, military surveillance-driven controversy could still deserve more attention between the both sides. The second point, I just trying to respond to the, uh, Lao Feng's question. What kind of a maritime power China will be go for? It's a still a big question for most of Chinese. We don't know what kind of a maritime power, what kind of a maritime power China will be, because according to the historical experience, it's overwhelmingly limited on China to be a land power rather than sea power. So China's a sea power adventure will be successful or will be some sort of, we we'll say, a new bank causing, you know, some sort of an uneasy process? We don't know. But at least cooperating with the United States is a big factor to reshape China's choice to be a maritime power. For that point, I'm very, very deeply convinced we need to cooperate of the, uh, with the United States on the maritime field. So uh, finally, please join me to thank four excellent panelists for their great insights. Let's have a 10 minutes break. <laughs>